everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. General intelligence in a system like chat, GPT, I, w- I would say there's a literature on that, but there's not like a settled test that everyone everyone would accept. And the, the Turing test, I think nobody in the AI research field takes very seriously, really. I mean, it was proposed by Alan Turing in the middle of the last century. And the idea was if an AI could imitate a human in conversation in a way that would fool people into thinking it was a person, then we should consider it as smart as a person. And that pretty much, I think Turing would not agree with that test now if he saw the internet and and what you could do with with large language models, because I see why that made sense in the 50s. I mean, while Turing was a very visionary guy, he just wasn't considering the possibility of systems that would ingest such insane amounts of text and sort of pastiche them together in a plausible looking way without understand understanding what's going on. I mean, Alan Turing would be super fascinated by this, by this, I'm sure, but he didn't conceive of that sort of system in the 1950s, which is, is understandable. So, I mean, I, I think, I think, well, if we're not there already, we'll be very soon at the point of a system that could pass the Turing test in the sense of fooling an average person that it w- that it was a human, and that's cool, but it doesn't tell you much about the underlying general intelligence. Coming up with a system that could fool me that it's a human in a two-hour conversation will be much, much harder, and you might really need to have a human-level general intelligence to, to, to do that, but that's because I'm an AI researcher, and I know how to poke a system to find where it's where it's bullshitting and papering over ignorance with with with, with clever verbiage. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Ben Gertzel, CEO and founder of the Singularity Net Foundation. Welcome to the show today. Hey, glad to be here. So Ben, in addition to Singularity and Net, you are also the chairman of the OpenCog Foundation. And I wonder if you could share with us how OpenCog is helping to build an open source AI framework. Sure. Yeah, OpenCog has been around longer longer than Singularity Net. So I got into the blockchain world in 2017, wanting to create a decentralized foundation for general intelligence as it emerges. But I've been working on trying to create general intelligences a lot longer than that. And my first serious attempt at that was called WebMind in the, in the late 90s. And I was working on a system called the Novamente Cognition Engine within a startup company called Novamente. And I open sourced some of the code underlying our Novamente Cognition Engine in 2008 to form OpenCog, which is based on a somewhat different paradigm than the deep neural nets that, that are, are sort of dominating the the media landscape regarding AI these days. It's a more of a multi-paradigm integrative AI approach where we have this large knowledge graph or more properly a hypergraph or metagraph with this large knowledge graph living in across many different machines in, in RAM and on disk. Then we have neural algorithms, we have logical reasoning algorithms, we have evolutionary algorithms, we have a variety of different AI techniques, all interoperating on the same distributed knowledge graph at at the same time. And, you know, attempting to learn from its experience and reshape its own knowledge graph in in, 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 in accordance with its own goals. So ne- neural nets are a part of it, but only one among a number of different algorithms in there. And just last year, we started building a new version of OpenCog called Hyperon, which is almost a rebuild from scratch with an attempt to get massively greater scalability that, that, than, than we had with the, with the previous version. I mean, much as in the neural net field, you know, I was teaching neural nets in the university 
democracy in the 80s and 90s, and they were cool, but they weren't setting the world on fire. Then you had you had GPUs, you had GPU libraries for matrix multiplication, the same old algorithms suddenly start setting the world on fire. So we're thinking with similar, you know, radically more scalable implementation, some of the, these other sort of more ambitious AI approaches will, will start to yield more and more results over the next few years. And the aspiration of OpenCog, uh, along with my own aspiration as a researcher, has always been not just building cool AI systems that do particular things, but working toward real artificial general intelligence, like machines that can reason, think, ima imagine, create, make conceptual leaps in more the way that people can. So what's uh, interesting uh, about what you're saying is uh, you've, you've seen the span of the evolution uh, in the last several decades, and, and certainly in the last 15 years, there's been a very fast clip of how Neuronet, as an example, have really progressed. And what you're talking about within your uh, open cog is this notion of not only making it scalable, but this multimodal approach of not just focusing on a particular slice of that modality, but lots of different things to kind of overlap it uh, to get to this really complex uh, graph that you're referring to. Very exciting. And underlying all of that, of course, is open source and available to the public, which we're going to come back to in just a second. Let's talk a little bit about your time at Hanson Robotics. You were the chief scientist there. And for those that are listening that are not familiar with Hanson Robotics, of course, they're the company behind Sophia the Robot. Tell us about your experience there. And do you agree with where the company is going now? Yeah, so I met David Hansen, must have been 2007 or so, and we immediately hit it off really well on a personal level. We had a common passion for the work of uh, Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer, and uh, also a common passion for, you know, trying to bring about a, a beneficial technological singularity and and, and so forth. And we uh, jammed some music together. We, 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 we generally became good friends. I moved from U.S. to Hong Kong in 2011. I invited David Hansen to vi visit me there and check out the local scene. In 2014, he moved Hansen Robotics to Hong Kong, and I began work working with him there in, in parallel with my, my work on the OpenCog and AGI R&D and some other things I was doing in machine learning for finance and whatnot. So I led the software team at Hansen Robotics for some time and was... Uh, which was the time when the Sophia robot was created, which is the, the first robot citizen and arguably in many ways, the most realistic humanoid humanoid robot out there. And I'm, I stepped back from a intensive role at Hanson Robotics in 2017 when I founded SingularityNet, the blockchain based AI platform I'm running now, but we're still, we're still working fairly closely together. There's various projects where SingularityNet is supplying AI software on, on on the back end for for different robots that Hanson Robotics is is making, and I, I learned a huge amount working with David about your know, human AI interaction, human human robot interaction, and sort of how to how to pull people into a full on you know emotional heart interaction with hmm. technology. Because I, I really, I have a math PhD. I really came at AI from the, the cognitive algorithms, right? Like not, not, not from the, the front end that's connecting with people. And David David knows algorithms too, but his his unique claim to fame has really been mastering the, the human AI interface on an emotional level, which has been quite quite fascinating to deal with. Like we, we did these trials using Sophia as a meditation guide and you can see some people are put into a really profound blissful trance state by the robot leading them through meditations which is just just fascinating to me and they say things like well with a robot i know the robot's not judging me like a human meditation guide is so i can relax more right so it's a it's really been quite interesting to see how that connection between human and technology is fostered by this this human-like user interface, which is what the robots ultimately are from a technologist's point of view. A very interesting comment, and you're absolutely right. It really is just that interface, a medium more than anything else, but the underlying aspects of the, the AGI. Uh, let's first define what artificial general intelligence 
is for the listeners. And you talk about the emergent behavior achieving complex goals and complex environments. And I wonder what that means. Yeah, intelligence is one of these slippery human concepts that doesn't really have such a general purpose, rigorous definition. And I think that's fine. I mean, life doesn't have such a rigorous definition. It's not stopping biologists from doing stuff. And the, the fact that a virus is weirdly poised between life and non-life is not doesn't stop you from doing virology, right? So I, I think it's okay that the concept of intelligence gets vague and weird and complicated when you look closely. But it has caused some difficulties in, in, in the AI field, right? Because when the AI field was founded in the middle of the last century, People were after building machines that could think like people and then even better than people, such as you see in, in science fiction novels and movies and, and whatnot. Then in the 60s and 70s, it became clear that you could make AIs doing various things that seem very intelligent when people do them, but the AI is doing it in a very different way than how people are doing it in a very narrowly specialized and focused way. Like, Checkers was beaten at the world champion level in the 1960s, right? And then chess in the 90s, and 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 go go more recently than that, right? But in the, I mean, each of these things, when a human does them, I mean, even to be the world champion of checkers requires quite a lot of general cognition for a person. But the AI is just crunching through some fairly mm -hmm. simplistic algorithms to to do it, right? So the discovery that you can do these things that seem really hard to us with relatively simple algorithms was a new discovery. It's a very cool discovery. And that led to what I call narrow AI, like AI systems that do things that to us seem really hard and really cognitive, but they do only that one little thing and they don't understand the context in which they're operating. And if you change the nature of their task a bit, you often have to rewire the AI a bit to, to adapt to the new, new sort of task, right? And this sort of narrow AI is extremely valuable for many applications. On the, on the other hand, it seems that fundamentally different thing than what human beings do. And we, we have a different sort of general intelligence, which allows us to make leaps into new domains and new realms of experience for which we're very poorly prepared. And we just sort of ad hoc feel it out as, 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 we, as we go along. And this is what my friend uh, Weaver, AKA David Weinbaum, called in his PhD thesis at Free University of Brussels. He called this open-ended intelligence. I mean, we're we're organisms that want to maintain our boundaries in ourselves, and we want to grow and transcend ourselves and learn more and more. And in doing that, we go and sort of conquer and interact with new 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 domains of 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 reality. And current narrow AI systems are not at all open-ended in, in in this sense. They're really designed to fulfill quite specific goals in in specific contexts. And it, it may be that when we get the first human level general intelligences engineered, when we get the first, you know, artificial open-ended intelligence systems, and maybe a lot of what they do is operate narrow AI systems, actually, because it, it's it's not like you need a general intelligence to recognize faces most of the time or to or to optimize a supply chain. But if you had an AGI operating this hopefully benevolent army of narrow AIs, they could then be coordinated in you know a context savvy way in in, in accordance with an overall understanding of the world. And overall understanding of the world is precisely what you now AIs now are lacking, which you can see very well in you know user facing systems like a Chat GPT or something, which is getting getting so much so much attention there. There's a lot of brilliance there, and there's a profound ignorance of overall life context which is is the is the narrow aspect of the ai there so so great points and and i really uh, like your point and i agree with you in terms of this kind of superset or broader orchestrating open broader orchestrating ai that really facilitates or supervises narrow ais underneath it and of course these days we're you know there's a lot of interest around generative ai like dali e lensa AI, for instance, you mentioned ChatGPT. ChatGPT, to your point, uh, though it may sound very smart to us, underneath it, the system itself has no cogn cognition of what it's uh, even talking about. But when we talk about organizations like OpenAI, DeepMind, Hanson, and others that are getting closer to achieving what we think is this open-ended AI, 
ter- a Turing test is probably not ad- adequate, right? So is there a criteria that, that the science community is using to indicate what is sentience? No, I'd say sentience, sentience is not a term that pops up often in the AI research world, actually. I, I, I mean, it, of course, it exists in the philosophy world, and you have distinctions between sentience and sapience and so forth. But I mean, you, when you're going through school and AI or going through the research world, you, you're not thinking about it. Whereas at least general intelligence, there's a research literature on various theoretical notions of general intelligence and then and then practical measures of general intelligence of, of systems. Sentience seems to weirdly mix up some notion of general intelligence with some notion of consciousness and and, and sort of subjective experience. And those are mixed up in the sort of natural language term of, of, of sentience in a way that I think most researchers don't want to deal with. So from, from the standpoint of trying to build AI systems that do stuff, be it narrow or general intelligence, you're basically concerned with the functional behavior of what, what can you make the system do. And if if you can throw the system to an env- environment that it has no background on and it can improvise and create and imagine and figure it out, then you're thinking it has more ability to generalize and more, more general in- in- intelligence. The question of whether a general intelligence or a narrow AI has subjective experience in the sense that people are presumably monkeys or, or, or dogs and so forth do. That's considered more of a philosophy question, maybe at the border of a neuroscience question, but not, you don't encounter that much in the, in the practical AI world and opinions are all over the map, right? I mean, I, I tend to be more Buddhistic and I figure this, this coffee cup has its own form of consciousness, which is uh, obviously different than that of myself or, or, of, or of an AI system. But other, others on my same project may take, take a different philosophy. But in terms of the general intelligence of a system like chat GPT, I, w- I would say there's a literature on that but there's not like a settled test that everyone everyone would accept. And the the Turing test, I think nobody in the AI research field takes very seriously, really. I mean, it was proposed by Alan Turing in the middle of the last century. And the idea was if an AI could imitate a human in conversation in a way that would fool people into thinking it was a person, then we should consider it as smart as a person. And that... Pretty much, I think Turing would not agree with that test now if he saw the internet and, and what you could do with, with large language models, because I see why that made sense in the 50s. I mean, while Turing was a very visionary guy, he just wasn't con- considering the possibility of systems that would ingest such insane amounts of text and sort of pastiche them together in a plausible looking way without understand understanding what's going on. I mean, Alan Turing would be super fascinated by this, by this, I'm sure, but he didn't conceive of that sort of system in the 1950s, which is, is understandable. So, I mean, I, I think, I think, well, if we're not there already, we'll be very soon at the point of a system that could pass the Turing test in the sense of fooling an average person that it, that it was a human. And that's cool, but it doesn't tell you much about the underlying general intelligence. Coming up with a system that could fool me that it's a human in a two hour conversation will be much, much harder. And you might really need to have a human level general intelligence to, to, to do that. But that's because I'm an AI researcher and I know how to poke a system to find where it's, where it's bullshitting and papering over ignorance with, 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 with clever verbiage, right? So, so I think uh, to your point, there's a lot of fantasy or, or even fantastical statements and a lot of interlacing with, let's say, storytelling. So what do you say to those people that are telling the story of fearing AGI and the doomsday warning that AI is going to someday overtake humans? Yeah, I, 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 the first thing I would say to anyone who's thinking about the long-term future or even the future a few decades from now, assuming we get to AGI on, the, on that time frame, which I think is quite possible. I think we could get human level general intelligence within five years, let's say. It could also be 30 years. I don't think it's going to be 100 years. And what happens after that point? Honestly, none of us can know. 
And if anyone thinks they know, I mean, they're either bullshitting themselves or they're drawing in a sort of non-rational spiritual source of knowledge, which uh, I mean, I don't want to entirely discount, but it's not a science thing, right? It's because once you've got minds that are 10 times more generally intelligent than human beings, it seems very foolish to think we could predict what these minds are going to do. They may understand, you know, the laws of physics in ways that go far beyond what we can understand. They may, they may make contact with alien intelligence that is all around us now all the time, and we just can't see it because we're too stupid, right? I mean, the, the bets are just off, right? And so I, I think if someone doesn't acknowledge that, they're not getting the sort of gravitas and grandeur and, and splendor of the idea of something that's, you know, more above us in terms of intelligence than we are above, say, monkeys or dogs or something, right? Because my, my my dogs, if they see me chatting to someone on the computer, they don't really know I'm talking to someone who's sitting far away on the other side of the globe, right? They're just too, they're too stupid to get it. And there's going to be a lot of things that super AI gets that we're too stupid to get. So having said that, there's a radical uncertainty here. And your orientation to that is going to depend on your emotional makeup and your sort of philosophical and spiritual paradigm as much as anything else. I, I, I tend to be an optimist and I have a strong, I would say, non-rational intuition that all this is going to come out really well. Some other people tend to be pessimist by constitution and have a strong feeling it's all going to come out badly. Elon Musk seems to somehow somehow be that way from his, his public statements. I've discussed it with him only, only very briefly, but I don't think people are rational to say there's a high odds that when we create superhuman AI, it's going to be bad for humans. I mean, you can say we don't know what's going to happen, and that's hard to argue with, but to say that a super AI is not going to have any need for people, it's going to turn all our molecules into extra hard drive space, it's going to enslave us or something. I mean, this this is, is to me, ridiculous, and there, there's no reason to think that a super AI is going to be like a really bad, obnoxious person with, with, with superpowers or something. I mean, I mean, we're a, a we're talking about a quite different kind of cognitive system that didn't evolve. So it didn't need to learn to kill and hunt and fight and struggle to, to survive. And B, we are shaping the mind of this system via what we do with it. So if we take early stage a, AGIs and we have them do education and medical care and, and, and science and things that are benevolent and helpful to people, my best intuition would be that this will cause the AGIs to grow up in a way that makes them basically well-intentioned toward people, because that's that's what they were shaped and, and, and evolved to do. I mean, it's not a guarantee, but it seems reasonably commonsensical, whereas if, if the first AGIs are killer robots or advertising engines designed to make people buy a bunch of garbage they they they, they don't need or, or if they're designed to spy on people and put them in jail if they don't obey some arbitrary legal code i mean maybe then when these agis grow up they will be obnoxious killer fascists right i, I, I mean so i i think i think yeah there's a there's a big irreducible uncertainty there on the other hand that's no reason to assume that bad outcomes are especially likely and i think the best we can do, given that we're not going to pause the development of AGI on the planet because there are too many competing parties working toward it. Now, like Putin at the AI Journeys Conference in, in, in 2019 said he wants Russia to move toward leadership in in AI, including an in artificial general intelligence, right? So he, he knows the difference. I wouldn't say Russia is moving too effectively in that direction uh, in, 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 in the years since, but it, it does indicate that you're not shutting this thing down, right? I mean, there, there's too many parties around the world who see see the value and power here. And given that you're not going to stop humanity from moving toward AGI, we should be trying to make AGI as loving and beneficial as, as, as possible and orient toward doing good things. And I think the AI research community sees that, right? whole bunch of AI researchers have signed on to a a petition saying they're not going to they're not going to work on advanced AI systems for for killing people, and I think I think this this is is at least a small step in 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 the right direction in terms of biasing 
the emergence of AGI within that great field of the unknown, at least biasing the odds toward positive outcomes. So there's a very important underlying belief system that somehow AGI in, in the control of private entities like that of Meta, other big tech, and even, even the once nonprofit open AI that's since become for-profit in 2019, that all of these could potentially have some potentially unknown and maybe even adverse impact to the eventual growth of what AGI could become. And why is decentralization so critical in helping to counter some of these things that have historically so I, I actually, centralized? I actually think that I think the big tech companies are not that likely to make the breakthrough to AGI for related reasons to why I don't think the military is is, is going to because you know, the, the military wants AI that will behave according to doctrine and, and be very easy to control. And this is part of why the Chinese government doesn't like AGI. They, they, they want AI that will do will do what they tell it to do, right? And uh, I mean, I lived in D.C. for nine years. I did AI for various government agencies. And, you know, the military guys, they by and large have the good of humanity at heart, but they, they, they want AI that will do what they tell it, right? I mean, that, 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 mm -hmm. that's, that's the way of thinking in that domain. And the way to get the most general intelligence with the most imagination and creativity fastest is not to make systems that will rigorously do what you tell them. I mean, you, the AI is going to want to go through a childhood phase. I mean, I've got a one-year-old and a four-year-old child at home. They, they don't do what I tell them, right? And, and their, their ability to not do what I tell them is part of, part of their imagination and, and, and learning and growth. And I think big tech has a weaker version of the same problem. I mean, they, they want, there's research skunk works operations, certainly, but bottom line is they want AIs that will help them make more money. And these are very rigorously metrics driven organizations. And we can see that in Google right now is paring down everything that's not helping them make more money by, by, by search. We're going to be able to click on web pages, right? So, I mean, I think if your goal is to optimize some fairly narrow commercial metric, I somewhat feel like you're always going to put most of your resources on narrower systems will help you optimize that 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 metric i mean any anything could happen of course some mad genius working for nsa or deep mind or whatever could come up with a breakthrough to agi i just think these big tech companies much like military are they're focused on metrics that are narrow they're focused on things that are controllable and and and, and predictable because of the sorts of entities that that they are and they're they're not the most likely system, most likely entities to come up with a, you know, a wild breakthrough toward open-ended in, in, intelligence. But but I think I think that's good because I think if one of these entities did, it probably wouldn't be wouldn't be for the for the better. Because I, I, not that these are bad-hearted people. I mean, I worked, you know, when I worked with U.S. Army intelligence in D.C., most of the people there were good-hearted and felt they were saving the world and. I know a lot of people in Google, they're mostly wonderful human beings also. It's just these, these particular organizations, you know, they have a mandate, they have a certain style of, of, of organization. They have very narrow swath of humanity operating within these organizations, within very narrow and particular cultures. And of course, there's tight connections between all the big tech companies and, and, and intelligence and military organizations, which are, are fairly fairly well well documented i mean for google you can just look up eric schmidt i mean so I, I i think that once there's a breakthrough to real general intelligence and it's really clear like hey someone knows how to make a machine that can really think like people and we may be there in you know three four years with an open cog project if we don't get there you know maybe deep mind gets there five years from now who, who knows who it is but what, once that breakthrough is made then i think and the game moves to a different phase. Then every world government realizes it's serious. Every corporate leader realizes it's 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 serious. Like the the most intensive, you know, meetings at, at Davos and Boal Forum become how do we deal with with the, the AGI threat and opportunity? And then th then what you're going to see is people want to close down, monopolize, and, and control it so their own party will gain advantage over all the other parties out there. So if if when you make that breakthrough, the AGI is rolled out, not just open source code, but on a decentralized infrastructure. So the actual running system is running on machines all, all over the world without any central controller. I mean, then 
then you have a system where people just ha- just have to deal with that, right? And the decentralized underpinning for the AGI is part of the reality that all the different parties are dealing with, which is the situation we have with the internet and Linux right now, right? Like, U.S. would probably cut Iran off the internet and stop them from using computer operating systems if they could, but they, they can't. Linux is open source, and the internet is a free and open protocol that anyone can use, and be, because of that, the openness of these things is just something that the whole global infrastructure has to work around. And I think if a, if early stage AGI is rolled out in a decentralized manner like that, then it will be similar. And I think that will stop any one party from monopolizing early stage AGI toward its own ends, which I believe will militate better toward the emergence of a beneficial AGI. And this is, of course, is a long and nuanced conversation because what, what you have on the one hand is some elite group which believes it knows what's going on and knows knows what's for the best, sort of controlling the transition from subhuman to superhuman level AGI, or the whole vast, seeming, chaotic, ambiguous mess of humanity sort of collaborating in an internet type way to to bring AGI from subhuman to superhuman level. So which which of these two things do you bet on to bias things in, in, in the positive direction, right? I mean, neither neither is neither is flawless, c- c- certainly, but I guess I'm, I'm enough of a sort of anarcho-socialist character to bet on the vast teeming chaos of all humanity than on a self-appointed elite group, but I, 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 I wouldn't say you can 100% be sure which which avenue would lead to the better outcome. All right, so we only have one minute left. So unfortunately, we can't go further into this conversation, even though yeah. it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, in the VC community, there's been quite a bit of intentional allocation to Web3 and decentralized movements. And I wonder if you have any opinions about that and if you feel like their thesis is generally right or are there aspects that you disagree I th- with? I think some form of Web3 will be will be the future. The extent to which that means focused Web3 companies will be important or to which it's just an ambient technology that gets woven into everything that happens is, isn't clear. So like on the on the OpenCog side, I mean, we have OpenCog is an open source project. We have, we have SingularityNet, which is a blockchain-based platform. We have a company called True AGI, which is sort of wrapping up OpenCog-based solutions for enterprise customers. And True AGI will build Web3 solutions and, and, and traditional cloud-based solutions, depending on what, what the customer wants. So there, there, that's not a Web3 company, but it's a company that's using, using Web3 technologies, right? So, I mean, I mean, and you, you can see that in, in simpler businesses, like a, a friend of mine, Danny Newcomb here in Seattle, he's, he's making a, a business called Incantio, which is providing music for sync licensing for people who want to use it in the background of, of videos and so forth. And again, that will have a web web three interface or, or, or a web two interface, depending on what people want to use the music for. Right. So I think, I think web three, certainly decentralized internet is, 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 is coming. I mean, the, the internet itself is very decentralized, right? TCP IP protocol is decentralized. It was decentralized in the get go. We've seen these more centralized, you know, monolithic services build up on top of that decentralized infrastructure. Now with Web3, in a way, we're going back to the roots and we're saying all this stuff that was built on top of the decentralized internet infrastructure can also be done in, in, a, in a decentralized way. And so, yeah, we're we're going to see decentralized social media. We'll see decentralized search, uh, eventually probably shopping. So I think I think all this is coming as core functionality exactly how it gets chopped up among different companies and and, and, and projects really remains to to crystallize. I, I do think there's been a bunch of sort of idiotic bullshit out there around uh, NFTs and metaverse land sales. I mean, there, there's been a bunch of silly things that obviously are not sustainable. I But I, I don't think all of Web3 is, is as stupid as, as the silliest manifestations. I also think current blockchain technology is not scalable enough to support the aspirations of of Web3, just just as current 
the current game technology is not up to supporting the metaverse ambition in a decentralized way. And so we we need a bunch of advances. On, on the blockchain side, I've launched a project called HyperCycle that's aimed at speeding up blockchain infrastructure by several orders of magnitude. You'll need similar innovations on the metaverse infrastructure side. So then you have the question of which Web3 things are viable to do now, and which things will be viable in a few years when more infrastructure technologies are there, which which gets deep into the plumbing. So, I mean, on, on the whole, I'm very bullish on, on Web3. That doesn't mean I think a high percentage of currently proposed Web3 projects are viable, right? I mean, and that, that, that gets into the details. Super. Uh, with that, I've been joined by Ben Curso, CEO and founder of Singularity Net Foundation. And thanks for joining today. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.